Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Horror Mine, where we talk about mysteries, thrillers, and horror movies. I'm your host, Vic Shy, and this week, my friends, we are treading into very divisive waters. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we are discussing Rob Zombie's Halloween. Coming fresh off of directing The Devil's Rejects, Rob Zombie took on the daunting task of remaking the beloved 1978 classic Halloween. Rob Zombie's Halloween was released in 2007 to mostly negative reviews from fans and critics. In my opinion, this is one of the better horror film remakes that doesn't really deserve all the hate. Rob Zombie's Halloween stays true to the story of the original film while giving us an in-depth look at the tragic backstory of Michael Myers. This is a brutal and unforgiving film that gives us one of the most terrifying versions of Michael Myers we've seen on screen. I'll be explaining and giving my interpretations of the events that take place throughout the film. Keep in mind that this is a very polarizing film. I'll be discussing my thoughts and opinions on the film which may heavily differ from yours. If you enjoy this video, make sure to click the like button as it really helps out the channel and I would truly appreciate it. But without further ado, sit back and relax and join me as we explore the tragic world of Michael Myers' past in Rob Zombie's Halloween. Our movie begins with a quote which says, The darkest souls are not those which choose to exist within the hell of the abyss, but those which choose to break free from the abyss and move silently among us. Dr. Samuel Loomis, probably. We are introduced to the reimagined Myers house that's a little more vulgar than I remember. Maybe I'll choke the chicken, purge my snorkel all over them flappy ass tits. Young Michael Myers is portrayed by then child actor Dag Furch, who gave a great performance that managed to be somewhat sympathetic yet creepy at the same time. Michael's mom, Deborah Myers, is portrayed by Sherry Moon Zombie, and his abusive a hole stepdad is played by William Forsyth. Michael is the middle of two siblings older sister Judith Myers and baby boo Angel Myers. Apart from his very loving mom, Michael endures a lot of abuse and neglect as a child. Ronnie is verbally and possibly physically abusive toward him. Judith could care less about him, and he gets bullied at school by Junie Cortez of all people. As I've mentioned, Deborah Myers is a loving mother who cares deeply for Michael. However, with Ronnie being deadbeat, she is forced to make ends meet working as a stripper, which Michael gets bullied for. She doesn't have nearly enough time to look after her son and is completely oblivious to his sick and deranged behavior towards small animals. Michael's real father passed away some time ago due to an unknown cause, which is briefly mentioned by Judith. This is a major difference from the original film, in which both of Michael's parents were still alive. The original Michael Myers' upbringing was a complete mystery, which added a mystique to the character that director John Carpenter wanted. Michael's mental state is brought into question by the school's principal, and it is here we meet Dr. Samuel Loomis, portrayed by actor Malcolm McDowell. They show her a dead cat found in Michael's backpack along with several pictures of dead, mutilated animals. Are you saying Michael did this? Michael loves animals. He Dr. Loomis states that harming smaller animals is often an early warning sign for bigger problems and suggests taking Michael through a series of psychological tests. Mrs. Myers is in denial over her son's behavior and only sees him as her innocent baby boy, which we see is no longer the case as in the very next scene, Michael brutally beats his bully Wesley to death with a large branch. On Halloween night, Deborah is busy working and can't take Michael trick-or-treating. Ronnie throws insults at him the entire time and Judith decides that sex is more important than her little brother's happiness. Sorry, squirt. But have fun. While trying to get it on, Judith's boyfriend Steve pulls out a reimagined version of the Michael Myers mask. Oh, so you guys aren't gonna take me trick-or-treating, huh? That's fine. Don't worry. I got something for that. Slice, bash, Stab. Michael proceeds to murder every single person in that house, all except for baby boo Angel Myers. Happy Halloween, boo. So you mean to tell me that Ronnie was asleep the entire time Michael was duct taping him? That's a lot of duct tape. 
This version of the Michael Myers mask somehow looks more sinister and angrier than the original Myers mask. The original mask seemed to have an almost blank and empty expression, which was very reflective of Michael Myers' void personality, just as he looked when his parents took off his mask in the original film. This version of the mask very much reflects the anger and hatred Michael harbors due to years of neglect, abuse, and the absence of a real father figure. This mask feels more personal and looks absolutely terrifying. Also, I never noticed how stupid I must have looked as a kid trying to rock a Michael Myers mask until I saw this film. Deborah Myers comes home and finds Michael sitting on the front porch holding Angel. The gruesome crime is recounted in chilling detail by a news reporter, while Deborah screams in shock and agony. Judith was stabbed 17 times, her boyfriend Steve beaten over the head with an aluminum bat, Ronnie's neck was sliced, and he was stabbed multiple times in the face and chest. Michael now sits in the back of a police car, appearing emotionless and without remorse for what he has just done. I can only imagine if Dr. Loomis was there. The tests, Mrs. Myers! We should have done the tests! Eleven months later, Michael Myers is found guilty of first-degree murder and transferred to Smith's Grove Sanitarium. Dr. Loomis is assigned as Michael's psychiatrist and the two build a very interesting relationship. It appears that Michael has no recollection of the murders he committed on Halloween night. You remember nothing about getting a knife? Mm -mm, I didn't do that. He is visited every week by his mother, the only beacon of light left in his life. Michael begins to make his own masks that he uses to hide his face. He feels that the masks hide his ugliness and that no one sees him. An orderly named Ishmael, portrayed by Danny Trejo, shows Michael kindness and gives him some advice about being stuck behind walls. You can't let those walls get you down. Believe me, I know. His mental state slowly starts to deteriorate as he loses the willingness to speak and now refuses to show his face. During one of his mother's visits, Dr. Loomis says that Michael hasn't spoken in over two weeks and they may want to consider shock treatment. The nurse watching over Michael thought it would be a good idea to turn her back to him and gets a fork lodged in her neck. Shock treatment, Mrs. Myers! Shock treatment! Michael appears to have some sort of split personality, one where he is still an innocent child that just wants to go home, the other where he is filled with nothing but hate and anger. Putting on a mask hides his innocent persona while his evil side slowly starts to take over. Overwhelmed with grief and the realization of the monster her son has become, Deborah Myers tragically takes her own life. Fifteen years later, Michael Myers has grown into an extremely large and physically imposing human being. His face is completely hidden behind his homemade mask, still void of any emotion. We see that Ishmael has been taking care of Michael this entire time and shows him kindness and respect. What do you mean you're sorry about these chains? You got feelings for this big idiot? Is that what it is? What's the dick going on, Ishmael? Michael hasn't spoken a word in fifteen years, and Dr. Loomis does not believe that there is anything else he can do for him. This is a significant moment in Michael Myers' life, as Dr. Loomis was not only his psychiatrist, but the closest thing he had to a real father figure. The doctor-patient dynamic shared between Dr. Loomis and Michael in this film is very interesting and something that's never been explored before. Now, a big change in Dr. Loomis's character from the original is that this version of Loomis has written a book on Michael titled The Devil's Eyes, The Story of Michael Myers. While we don't know the exact contents of the book, this appears to be very exploitative of Michael Myers and the terrible events that occurred to the small town of Haddonfield. This is later brought up by Sheriff Brackett, portrayed by Brad Dorif, and explored further in the 2009 sequel. Michael Myers is now set to be transferred to a separate facility by several armed guards portrayed by Rob Zombie regulars, Bill Mosley, Leslie Easterbrook, and Tom Tolles. As we all expected from a prisoner transfer scene, things go terribly wrong as Michael easily breaks out of his chains and brutally murders all the guards. Ishmael sees the bloody aftermath of Michael's rampage and nervously attempts to get him back into chains. The kindness and respect he has shown toward Michael all these years seem to bear no significance to Michael as he proceeds to murder Ishmael. I was good to you, Wayne. Yeah, but you never let me watch TV, did you? 
The murder of Ishmael proves that Michael has lost all sense of humanity and reasoning. He has turned into a complete monster, incapable of compassion or remorse. Now, wait a minute. Who the heck thought it would be a good idea to have Michael Myers transferred the night before Halloween? Was St. Patrick's Day booked Christmas Eve? Come on, people! Trick or treat, baby! Dr. Loomis receives a call from a Dr. Complinson, portrayed by Clint Howard, letting him know that Michael has escaped. Michael heads to a nearby truck wash and murders a man named Big Joe Grizzly, who was just trying to pass this beast in peace. He robs Joe Grizzly of his coveralls and now has one half of his Halloween costume. This scene really highlights the physicality that actor Tyler Mayne brought to the role of Michael Myers. The original Michael Myers actor Nick Castle was 5 feet 10 inches tall, while Tyler Mayne stands at a towering 6 feet 9 inches tall. Mayne's portrayal of Michael Myers is in my opinion one of the best things to come from the 2007 remake. On October 31st, we finally meet Laurie Strode, now portrayed by actress Scout Taylor Compton. Laurie's portrayal is in my opinion one of the less likable aspects of the remake. While actress Scout Taylor Compton does her best with the material she's given, she feels like a totally different character than the original Laurie Strode, portrayed by Jamie Lee Curtis. Mr. Nichols touched me the wrong way. Oh! Lori walks over to the old Myers house with Tommy Doyle, who says that it's the devil's house and that the boogeyman lives in there. At the same time, Michael Myers is inside of the house and retrieves his trademark mask and knife, which were hidden underneath a floorboard. The mask is now darker with several cracks due to having aged over the years and looks absolutely amazing. This mask combined with Tyler Mayne's performance and physicality make this my personal favorite version of Michael Myers. Just like in the original film, Michael sets eyes on Lori outside of his house and begins quietly stalking her throughout the town. Lori meets up with her friends Linda and Annie Brackett, portrayed by Danielle Harris, who played Jamie Lloyd in Halloween's 4 and 5. Dr. Loomis arrives in Haddon field and finds that Michael has taken the headstone from his sister's grave and replaced it with a dead dog. He is accompanied by none other than the late legendary Sid Haig. That night, Linda and her boyfriend, Bob, decide to get it on in the old Myers house. Bob gets murdered while doing a beer run and Michael chokes Linda to death before sweeping her off her feet and carries her away. I didn't know Michael was such a romantic. At a gun store, Dr. Loomis arms himself with a 357 Magnum that would make Barry Burton drool. After Lori drives off with Annie, Michael pulls off the slickest sneak attack I've ever seen and murders Lori's parents. Michael then sneaks his way into Lindsay Wallace's house, who is being babysat by Annie. They walk over to Tommy Doyle's house so Lori can babysit the pair and Annie can sneak off with her boyfriend Paul. Dr. Loomis meets with Sheriff Brackett and tries to explain to him that Michael Myers has returned to Haddonfield. Sheriff Brackett tells Loomis that he doesn't like him and believes he is exploiting the town and Michael Myers to make money. While this is true, Dr. Loomis is genuinely trying to prevent another massacre from happening, as he knows full well what Michael is capable of. Sheriff Brackett attempts to call the Strodes on their house phone, unaware that they are lying dead inside their house. Let's go. He reveals to Dr. Loomis that he was the one who responded to Deborah Myers' suicide. Wanting her to live a normal life, he took baby boo Angel Myers and drove her to a hospital in the next town. He omitted her existence from the report and she was later adopted by the Strodes, revealing that Lori Strode is actually Angel Myers, Michael's baby sister. Michael must really hate people that have sex as he attacks Annie and Paul in the living room. Lori arrives and sees Annie bleeding on the floor as well as Paul, who now looks like a very very expensive Halloween decoration. Lindsay and Tommy run out of the house yelling for help as Lori makes a call to 911. The call is dispatched over the radio and heard by Dr. Loomis and Sheriff Brackett, who are several minutes away. She rushes over to Tommy's house and bangs on the door for what feels like an eternity. Michael effortlessly breaks down the door and continues his pursuit of Lori. The police suddenly arrive at the house, but being that this is a horror movie, they never stood a chance and are killed within minutes. Michael knocks Lori 
Rory out cold and carries her off into the night. Michael sure does know how to treat the ladies. Sheriff Brackett arrives on scene and sees his bloody daughter laying on the floor. Dr. Loomis is alerted by Lindsay and Tommy that Michael took Lori away. Lori wakes up in the Myers house and sees the body of her dead friend Linda in front of Judith Myers' headstone. Michael quietly walks in and shows her the picture of his younger self holding her as a baby. He then takes off his mask and drops to his knees, possibly with the hopes that she will recognize him as her older brother. Because he can no longer speak and she doesn't know the truth about her lineage, Lori doesn't understand what Michael is trying to convey. While Michael's true intentions are unknown, it seems that he is trying his best to reconnect with the only living relative he has left. As seen in the beginning of the film, Michael was very fond of Angel and she was the only one he truly loved apart from his mother. Even though she was a baby, it seemed that the two shared a close bond with one another. Even though she doesn't recognize him, Michael instantly seemed to know Lori was his baby sister, which explains why he began to stalk and pursue her. In this scene, Michael is completely vulnerable as this is his first time attempting to show any kind of emotion in years. He shows no intent on harming Lori and just wants to be with his sister, the only thing that remains of Michael's humanity. She uses this opportunity to stab Michael in the shoulder with his own knife, which briefly incapacitates him. He chases her into the back of an empty swimming pool and is confronted by Dr. Loomis. Loomis pleads with Michael to stop and eventually shoots Michael three times with his magnum. <laughs> His leg! My leg! Dr. Loomis escorts Lori to a police car and they deliver the same classic lines as the original film. Is that the boogeyman? I do believe it was. What's the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was. However, this time, Michael bursts through the window and drags Lori back into the house. Loomis again tries to reason with Michael, which almost gets his face over and martelled. Lori grabs Loomis's gun and attempts to hide in the attic. Michael wants perfect attendance to the family reunion and begins smashing holes into the ceiling with a 2x4. Lori falls from the ceiling and gets up bloodied and disoriented. She points the gun at Michael, who then tackles her out of the window and off of the balcony. She wakes up and hears several emergency sirens in the background. As she points the gun at Michael's head, he suddenly grabs her arm and the gun goes off. We see some blood splatter, but it isn't confirmed where or if she actually shot Michael. Lori begins to scream uncontrollably as the sirens grow louder and closer as the movie ends. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Rob Zombie's Halloween. My friends, I really enjoyed this reimagining of the 1978 classic. I thought that Rob Zombie did a great job with giving Michael Myers a backstory, which helped make this a more personal Halloween film than we've ever seen. However, I completely understand those who felt it was unnecessary, as it does take away from the mystique of the character. Also, some of the characters and their dialogues do fall victim to the stereotypical Rob Zombie-esque writing that we've come to know from his previous films. Most notably, Laurie Strode, as I feel her character was totally different from that of the original and was never truly fleshed out. Apart from that, I feel that Rob Zombie gave us a truly unique and underrated entry in the Halloween franchise, and one of the best and most terrifying versions of Michael Myers we've ever seen. With all this in mind, I highly recommend you check out Rob Zombie's Halloween, as it is in my opinion one of the better horror movie remakes. But as always, I hope you all enjoyed the video, and if you did, make sure to click the like button as I would truly appreciate it. Thank you all for tuning in, and I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the horror mine. Y'all stick around.